The Egyptians, like several other pagan cultures, worshipped a wide range of natural gods and attributed their powers to natural phenomena they observed in their surroundings. There was a sun god, a river god, a childbirth god, and a crop god. When the pharaoh saw the Israelites were multiplying all around him, he became concerned, fearing that they would join Egypt's enemies during a time of war. Pharaoh decided to take advantage of the Israelites' economic potential. He appointed taskmasters over them and subjected them to forced labor. The Israelites were now enslaved. As it morphed out, the more oppressive Egypt was to the Israelites, the more they multiplied. Despite Pharaoh's mistreatment, their numbers only increased. This indicates that God was blessing them even while they were suffering. Nonetheless, the Egyptians came to fear them, and Pharaoh treated them cruelly. Exodus 1, 12-14 But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Pharaoh chose an even more heinous method of population control. He instructed the Hebrew midwives to kill any sons born to the Hebrew women. The midwives, on the other hand, refused to follow the king. The failure of Pharaoh's second attempt to control the Israelites' numbers was the final straw. He ordered that every son born to Hebrews be thrown into the Nile. With this decree, the stage was set for Moses' ascension. Exodus 1, 18-22 Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. A woman from Levi's family had a son. She saw his beauty and hid him for three months, trusting God over Pharaoh's edict's power. Hebrews 11:23. By faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. When she couldn't hide him any longer, the woman threw her son into the Nile River in a basket. She hoped that in God's providence, this body of water where the babies were drowning would serve as a means of delivery for her child. Miriam, the baby's sister, waited to see what God would do. Exodus 2, 1-4 Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. When Pharaoh's daughter arrived at the river to bathe, she discovered the basket containing the Hebrew baby and felt sympathy for him. God had intervened on his people's behalf. Pharaoh's daughter agreed to the boy's sister's offer to find a Hebrew mother to nurse the boy. The baby was under threat of death one moment, and his mother was being paid by Pharaoh's daughter to raise him the next. Exodus 2, 1-10 Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking alongside the bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. This is God's sovereign power at work. When the boy was old enough, his mother gave him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. Then she gave him the name Moses. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. 
In a divine irony, the future prophet of God who would bring plagues upon Egypt and lead slaves to freedom was being nurtured right under the nose of the enemy oppressor. As he grew older, Moses became aware of his own people's oppression. 2.11 Despite his advantages, Moses decided to identify with and help the Hebrews at some point along the way. When Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew one day, he killed the Egyptian and hid his body. When he tried to break up a fight between two Hebrews the next day, one of them asked, Who made you a judge over us? They rejected Moses' offers of peace and deliverance. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Acts 7.25 Moses had made a mistake. The Hebrew then asked Moses if he intended to kill him in the same way that he had killed the Egyptian. And Moses became terrified when he realized his actions had been exposed. When Pharaoh finally realized what was going on, he tried to kill Moses, and that was the end of it. Moses had to flee for his life to Midian, which was located on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba in modern Saudi Arabia. Exodus 2, 14 and 15 The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. He went from a wealthy upbringing to being on the run. He had Pharaoh for a step-grandfather one moment and was being hunted like a fox the next. In his efforts to help his native people, Moses was well-intentioned but rash. In Midian, Moses came to the defense of the priest's daughters, who was known in the Bible by several names, Ruel, Jethro, and Hobab. This father invited Moses to dinner and eventually gave him his daughter Zipporah as a wife as a result of Moses' kindness. She bore Moses' a son, Gershom, and Moses went to work as a shepherd in Midian. Exodus 2, 16-22 Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man, who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. What a case of downsizing! Moses had transitioned from being Pharaoh's protege to working as a desert herder. But in reality, God was working behind the scenes to prepare his people's deliverer. God must sometimes bring you low in order to bring you high, in order to accomplish his purposes through you. After many years, Egypt's king died, but things didn't get any better for the Israelites. Their work was so difficult that they begged God for help. The God of heaven and earth listened to the cries of his people. He was paying attention. Why? The answer is based on a single word, covenant. The Lord had made an agreement with Abraham to make his descendants a powerful nation and to provide them with a powerful land. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Exodus 2, 24 and 25 Moses was an 80-year-old man working for his father-in-law at the time. He had most likely come to accept this as his lot in life. But everything changed when he arrived at Horeb, the mountain of God, another name for Mount Sinai, where God would soon enter into a covenant with the nation of Israel. Moses was about to have a new encounter with God after 40 years of dealing with the consequences of his actions. That is clearly not normal. That should come as no surprise, because the Lord says, My thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. God's extraordinary plan was about to intrude on Moses' ordinary day. Exodus 3, 1-5 Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Arab, the mountain of God. 
There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. He needed to humble himself. He also needed to be reminded of where he came from. Man was made out of the dust from the ground. Genesis 2, 7 By removing his sandals, then Moses meekly identified with his humble beginnings. God consistently reveals his special presence in life's contradictions. Moses hid his face when he knew who was speaking to him, because he was afraid to look at God. To put it another way, he took God seriously. At that point, the Lord revealed to Moses that he had witnessed the plight of his people in Egypt. He was not unaware of their predicament, but he had heard their cries. Exodus 3, 6 through 10. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their sufferings. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perserites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God not only determines the ends, but he also determines the means. He was prepared to save his people, and he explained to Moses how he would do so. As an elderly man, Moses may have thought his life was coming to an end as he spent time with the sheep. The Lord, on the other hand, was still preparing him. He gave Moses 40 years of uptown training in Egypt, followed by 40 years of wilderness training. That was all that was required to prepare this shepherd to lead the sheep of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. Of course, Moses' wilderness journey was also the result of his murder of an Egyptian. But God can make a miracle out of a shambles. By the time God chose Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, the bold and brazen man who murdered an Egyptian and expected his fellow Hebrews to look up to him had vanished. Instead of seizing the opportunity to deliver Israel, he asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Exodus 3, 11. Moses' pride had been shattered, and take note of how the Lord responded. I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Exodus 3, 12. God had also revealed his purpose in setting his people free. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship me at this mountain. Meaning, God wasn't freeing the Israelites so they could sit around and do nothing. He was freeing them so that they could do what they had been created for. He wanted them to worship him as the one true God. Whenever God delivers you from something, he also delivers you to something, himself. But how would Moses persuade Israel of this? They'd want to know who signed off on his job role if he showed up and said he was supposed to be their deliverer. On whose command was Moses acting? Who gave him the power? Exodus 3, 13 through 15. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. The English translation of the first person singular Hebrew verb, meaning to be, is I am. I will be what I will be. Or, I cause to be what I cause to be, are the other possible translations. 
God was affirming his self-existence and self-sufficiency by describing himself in this way. He is reliant on nothing and no one. He is the all-powerful creator and sustainer of all things. This Hebrew verb is contextually related to the name Lord. Many people claim to believe in an all-encompassing God. However, Moses was to inform the Israelites that he had been sent by the one true God, the Lord, the God of their forefathers. He is the only God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the personal, all-powerful God who is responsible for everything that exists and sovereignly directs all things to achieve his kingdom purposes. He is, despite the fact that the world is constantly changing. If Moses needed assurance that he was following and obeying the one who was sending him, he got it. Moses was to tell the Israelites that their God, the Lord, was intimately aware of their plight in Egypt and had come to deliver them to a land flowing with milk and honey. God promised that they would listen to his words. Then Moses was to stand before the king of Egypt and tell him to let the people go into the wilderness to worship the Lord. Exodus 3, 16 through 18. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perserites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. However, God made it clear that Pharaoh would not agree to this. As a result, God would respond with miraculous displays of divine power in order to persuade the king to release Israel. The Lord would also make certain that the Israelites did not leave Egypt with nothing. In fact, the Egyptians would gladly give Israel wealth in order to get rid of them. As a result, the Israelites would pillage Egypt. In a sense, they would be paid back for their lost wages. Exodus 3, 19-22 but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Thus, Moses and the Israelites were to act in faith, trusting that the self-sufficient God who had revealed himself to them would be everything they could ever need. Moses was still jittery. What if they don't believe me, he wondered. As a result, the Lord literally filled his hands with reasons to be confident. When he told Moses to throw his shepherd's staff on the ground, it magically transformed into a snake when he picked it up, it transformed back into a staff. The Lord assured his servant that the people of Israel would believe that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had appeared to him through such miracles. If the Israelites did not believe this sign, God would use other supernatural signs to persuade them. Exodus 4, 1 through 9. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hands. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored, like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. 
But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. This still wasn't good enough for Moses. He said, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who made them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if it were your mouth and as if it were God to him. But take this staff in your hand, so you can perform the signs with it. Exodus 4, 10-17 The Lord told Moses that those who wanted to kill him were no longer alive. The previous Pharaoh's son had succeeded him. So Moses gathered his wife and sons and set out for Egypt. Exodus 4, 18-20 Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord told Moses to perform the miracles for which he had given him power, but God would harden Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the people go. It is worth noting, however, that God did not harden Pharaoh's heart until Pharaoh had already hardened himself. When Pharaoh refused to listen again and again, God told him, Have it your way. He only hardened his heart even more in order to use Pharaoh's rebellion to his greater glory and to achieve his kingdom purpose. Moses was to inform Pharaoh that the Lord had told him, Israel is my firstborn son. 4.22 in other words, the race of people that the king was abusing was not just any random group. God, the Creator, God them as his son and adopted them as his own. Furthermore, Israel was his firstborn child. In the ancient Near East, the firstborn held a position of honor and privilege. Pharaoh had enslaved those whom God had commanded him to respect. The king of Egypt would pay a hefty price for his rebellion if he refused to honor God's firstborn son. Exodus 4, 21-23 The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, Let my son go, so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them, and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Exodus 4, 27-31 The time had come for a showdown. Moses and Aaron approached Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Exodus 5, 1 If Pharaoh had heeded this simple request, he could have saved himself a lot of trouble. Instead, because he didn't know the Lord, he refused to obey him. He didn't acknowledge him as a deity in Egypt's pantheon. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Exodus 5, 2 They reiterated the request, emphasizing that they were under the Lord's command, and that if they did not obey, he would become angry and punish them. Pharaoh, instead of relenting, accused Moses and Aaron of allowing the people to be unproductive. 
Exodus 5, 3-5 Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. As a result, he made the decision to put the enslaved people in their place and prevent any further unruliness. He directed the Egyptian overseers and Israelite foremen not to provide the Israelites with straw for making bricks, but rather to allow them to gather it themselves and produce the same number of bricks. He concluded that would keep the unmotivated slackers busy and prevent them from whining about worshiping the Lord any longer. Exodus 5, 6-9 the Israelites were informed, and they dispersed throughout the land to gather stubble for straw. When the Israelite foremen failed to meet their quota, they were beaten. They complained to Moses about the injustice, but he simply blamed it on their desire to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Exodus 5, 10-18 Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, Why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. When the Israelite foreman left Pharaoh's presence, he challenged Moses and Aaron. They were furious, accusing the brothers of exacerbating the situation and pleading with God to judge them. If the Hebrews didn't want Moses as a deliverer in the past, they didn't want him now. Exodus 5, 19 through 21. Moses became despondent. Because the people were blaming him, he shifted the blame to God, saying, why have you caused trouble for this people? And why did you ever send me anything? You have done nothing to help your people. Exodus 5, 22 through 23. In other words, he accused God of making things worse and failing to keep his promise. One has to wonder what Moses was expecting when he and Aaron first appeared before Pharaoh. God had warned him that Pharaoh's heart would be hard, that their freedom would come only through God's mighty power and that it would be a fight to the death. Nonetheless, God recognized Moses' distress and did not reprove him. Everything that had happened up to this point had been mere foreshadowing. Things were about to heat up. Exodus 6, 1-5 Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Whenever the Bible says that God remembers, it does not mean that he recalls something he had previously forgotten. It means he's ready to act to fulfill his obligation based on a covenant promise he made. The season of deliverance had arrived for Israel in God's perfect timing. The Lord would deliver Israel from slavery. His outstretched arms represent his supernatural power, which would so pervade history that people would be talking about what happened in Egypt thousands of years later. If Pharaoh had immediately released the Israelites, the Israelites might have credited their deliverance to Pharaoh's generosity or Moses' eloquence. Instead, as the following chapters show, 
Subsequent generations would have no doubt that it was the Lord who had rescued his people from Egypt with his outstretched arm. He was the only one who could write the story that was about to unfold, so he deserved all the glory. Exodus 6.6 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Importantly, God was not freeing the Hebrews to spend their days as their own masters. He was preparing them for a relationship. They would be his people, and he would be their God in the promised land. In the coming years, the people of Israel would recognize him as their Lord, their God, who delivered them from the Egyptians' forced labor. Exodus 6, 7, and 8 I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Regardless of what Moses told the people, they refused to listen due to their broken spirit and slave labor. After all, Moses' real first attempt to deliver them had only resulted in more labor. So when God told Moses to speak to Pharaoh a second time, he was hesitant once more. He posed the question, how will Pharaoh listen if the Israelites refuse to listen? Again, Moses emphasized his lack of eloquence, as if it would somehow jeopardize God's plan. God, on the other hand, meant to deliver the people through his outstretched arm, not Moses' eloquence. As a result, he issued commands to Moses and Aaron. Exodus 6, 9-13 Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. The Levites would be in charge of the tabernacle, and Aaron's descendants would be in charge of priestly duties. This genealogy helps establish that Aaron and Moses were descended from Levi, Jacob's third son. Because they were Jacob's first and second sons, Reuben and Simeon are named first. Exodus 6, 14-25 The fact that the Lord told Aaron and Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt indicates that these two had the right family credentials for the job God had assigned them. Exodus 6, 26-30 It was this Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, this same Moses and Aaron. Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Exodus 7, 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. We see more evidence that the Lord would harden Pharaoh's already hard hearts even more. Because Pharaoh refused to listen, God would stretch out his hand in judgment against Egypt and put his hand into Egypt to deliver his people. This serves as a reminder that everyone will come into contact with God's hand, whether it is hardness or merciful. Exodus 7, 3-5 But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs into wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did exactly what the Lord told them to do. There is no higher compliment a person can receive. Those who follow in his footsteps will hear the Lord Jesus exclaim, Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, 23 It is worth noting that these two brothers began their ministry at the ages of 80 and 83. The senior years can be the most fruitful for the godly saint devoted to the king's agenda. Exodus 7, 6 and 7 Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. 
to persuade Pharaoh of the Lord's power. The messengers first showed him Moses' staff. Pharaoh was not impressed when it turned into a serpent and had his sorcerers do the same through their occult methods. But lest Pharaoh believe that his magic and the Lord's supernatural power were equal, Aaron's staff swallowed both of their staffs. Pharaoh's heart, however, was hard. He was a rebel against God's will at the core of his being. Exodus 7, 8-13 The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. As a result, the first of God's plagues, which were basically divine curses, began. As the king stood by the Nile's bank, Moses and Aaron warned him that the Lord would turn the river to blood and make the water unfit to drink. What had once been a source of life for Egypt would now be a source of death. Exodus 7, 14-18 Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says, By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. In the presence of Pharaoh and his officials, Aaron took Moses' divinely empowered staff and struck the water in the Nile at God's command. The Egyptians were unable to drink the water because it had turned to blood. Once again, Egypt's magicians did the same thing through their occult methods, most likely through some sort of sleight of hand, but on a much smaller scale. Even if they could duplicate God's miracle, they couldn't undo it. As a result, the Egyptians had to dig for water for a week while the Nile became polluted and stank. Pharaoh's heart remained stone, and he simply walked away from the first clear evidence of God's hand at work against him. Pharaoh was afflicted by the most heinous of all sins, pride. He refused to acknowledge divine authority. Exodus 7, 19-24 The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and over all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace, and did not take even this to his heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water, because they could not drink the water of the river. The Lord's message to Moses and Aaron the next time they appeared before Pharaoh was the same, Let my people go, so that they may worship me. This time the king's refusal would result in a frog plague throughout the land. There were frogs in the bed, frogs in the ovens, and frogs in the kneading bowls with a wave of Moses' staff. They were all over. However, Pharaoh's magicians imitated this sign once more. Ridding the land of them would have demonstrated true spiritual power, but they were unable to do so. Exodus 8, 1 through 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, 
I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds, and make frogs come on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said this time, Ask the Lord to remove the frogs, then I will let the people go. But take note of Moses' astute response. You may have the honor of choosing. When should the frogs be removed? This move would prevent Pharaoh from claiming that their arrival and departure was a freak of nature. Rather, it was an act of God. When Moses cried out to the Lord for assistance, he responded. The frogs, however, did not simply hop away. They died, leaving behind a foul stench. Exodus 8, 8 through 14. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said, Moses replied, It will be as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials, and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They were piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. When Pharaoh saw the relief, he hardened his heart once more. This is indeed a warning to all of us. When we are going through a difficult time, we often turn to God for help. However, as soon as the relief wears off, we can easily return to business as usual. Importantly, while the Lord could have obliterated this conceited Pharaoh, he gave him numerous chances to repent. God's kindness was meant to lead the king to repentance, but Pharaoh was uninterested in God's generous gift. Exodus 8, 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. The third plague struck without warning. God turned the dust of the land into swarms of gnats all over Egypt. They were all over people and animals. Egypt's sorcerers were unable to replicate the plague, using their magical arts on this occasion. They realized they were in over their heads for the first time and confessed to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh did not only refuse to listen to Moses and Aaron, he was no longer willing to listen to his own spiritual advisors. Exodus 8, 16 through 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their own secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. The Lord soon announced the fourth plague to Moses. Swarms of flies were on their way. They would fill the Egyptian people's homes. But this time, God explicitly stated that he would give special treatment to his people in Goshen. He would distinguish between the Israelites and the Egyptians by forbidding flies from entering his people's land. By announcing the plague in advance and preventing the flies from swarming in a specific geographical area, God provided further proof to all involved that the ecological disasters that suddenly fell on Egypt were the result of his power alone. Exodus 8, 20-23 Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me. 
If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. Pharaoh decided to try to reach a compromise and offered to let the people go to Egypt to sacrifice to God. But Moses refused to bargain. The Egyptians would stone the Israelites if they stayed in Egypt because they despised their sacrifices. The acceptable worship of the true God clashed with the pagan Egypt's religious practices. Exodus 8, 24 through 27. And the Lord did this. Dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses of his officials. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by the flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses said, That would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord, our God, would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, as he commands us. Pharaoh agreed, requesting that the Israelites not travel far and that Moses make an appeal to the Lord on his behalf. Moses agreed, but cautioned Pharaoh against deception. God answered Moses' prayer, and every last fly flew away, which had to be a welcome relief. Nonetheless, Pharaoh hardened his heart marching ever closer to destruction. Exodus 8, 28 through 32. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. Now pray for me. Moses answered, As soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord, and tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Only let Pharaoh be sure that he does not act deceitfully again by not letting the people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The flies left Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Not a fly remained, but this time also Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. God demanded once more from the king of Egypt, let his people go so that they may worship. Refusing would result in a severe plague on Egyptian livestock in the field. However, the Lord would once again distinguish between Israel and Egypt. The former's livestock would live, while the latter's would perish. There had been no destruction of property or bodily suffering as a result of Pharaoh's defiance up to this point, unless you consider having frogs hopping on your pillow to be a painful experience. However, all of that was about to change. The loss of the livestock would have dealt a serious blow to Egypt's economy. Nonetheless, when Pharaoh saw that no Israelite livestock had been harmed, he remained unmoved. Exodus 9, 1-7 Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses, donkeys, and camels, and on your cattle, sheep, and goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. The Lord set a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding, and he would not let the people go. Then God told Moses and Aaron to take handfuls of furnace soot and toss it in front of Pharaoh. It would turn into dust and cause festering boils on both man and beast. The Egyptians were subjected to excruciating physical pain as a result of the sixth plague. Even Pharaoh's magicians were unable to stand in front of Moses because they were covered in boils. Pharaoh, on the other hand, was defiant, unmoved by the plight of his own subjects. As a result, the Lord removed all restraint and allowed the king to succumb to his own destructive habits. 
Pharaoh's heart was finally supersized by God. God warned once more to release the Israelites before unleashing his seventh curse on him and his people. If not, he will send all of his plagues against Egypt to show the nation that there is no one like Lord on the entire planet. Don't forget that with each plague, God was allowing Pharaoh to humble himself and repent while demonstrating his sovereign power over his creation. But despite his grace, God would increase the pressure until Pharaoh finally admitted that the Lord was God and that he, Pharaoh, was not. Exodus 9, 13 and 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you, and against your officials and your people, so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. God said to Pharaoh through his intermediaries, By now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you, and you would have been obliterated, Take note of what he does here. It's as if the king of Egypt is a spoiled child who has repeatedly spoken back to his father, earning the response, Do you understand whom you're talking to, young man? Except that in the biblical case, the situation is greatly exaggerated. Parents have little control over their children. God has absolute righteous authority over all his creations. Pharaoh believed he could oppose God and prevent him from carrying out his will. In reality, the king's life was on the line. He only existed because of God's mercy. Exodus 9, 15 For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. God said, I have allowed you to live for this purpose, to demonstrate my power and to make my name known throughout the world. Christians frequently cite Romans 8, 28's gracious promise. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. But there is a flip side to that reality. All things can conspire against those who despise God and oppose His purposes. Exodus 9, 16 But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Make no mistake. God is the supreme king of the universe, and he will bring his kingdom goals to fruition. He has given everyone the option of cooperating with him or opposing him. God will be glorified, whether through us or despite us. If you cooperate with God's sovereignty, it does not mean that you will not face adversity and suffering. Rather, it means that the good, bad, and ugly of your life will be blended together in God's blender, eventually bringing you to where he wants you to be. If, on the other hand, you rebel against the all-powerful God, know that you have not escaped his sovereignty. God will continue to do exactly what he desires. You, on the other hand, will be on the wrong side of his sovereignty and will be removed from the protection of his blessing. Because of Pharaoh's stubbornness, plague number seven was on its way. The Lord was about to unleash the worst hailstorm Egypt had ever seen. But once again, God tempered his wrath with mercy urging the man to bring all the livestock that had survived the fifth plague into the shelters. Everyone and every animal who was outside when the hail fell would be killed. By this time, some of Pharaoh's officials had learned to fear the Lord's word and had brought their livestock in. Others, however, followed their king's lead. Exodus 9, 17-21 You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Therefore, at this time, tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt, from the day it was founded until now. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter, because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field, and they will die. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. A severe hailstorm with lightning struck the area, killing both people and animals. God, on the other hand, spared the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. This distinction establishes that this was not the work of Mother Nature, a fictitious figure who is frequently wrongly credited with the wonders of the natural world. Rather, it was the work of Father God the true creator and sustainer of all. Exodus 9, 21-23
22-26 Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, so that hail will fall all over Egypt, on people and animals, and on everything growing in the fields of Egypt. When Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail, and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. Pharaoh admitted his sin and the Lord's righteousness. He pleaded with Moses to pray for him and promised to let Israel go. On the surface, the man appeared to be changing. As a result, Moses promised to pray to the Lord, and the hail would stop. God, on the other hand, had given Moses spiritual insight into Pharaoh's heart. Moses told him before the meeting ended, I know you still do not fear the Lord God. Indeed, Egypt's king was willing to say whatever was required to bring about a change in his dreadful circumstances. However, there had been no spiritual transformation in his heart. Exodus 9, 27-30 then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he said to them. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Moses replied, When I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop, and there will be no more hail, so you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. God had been merciful to Egypt even in the midst of all this devastation. Although the flax and barley were destroyed, the wheat and spelt were saved because they were not yet in season. God's wrath was severe, but he did not destroy the entire food supply. Surprisingly, Pharaoh saw this as an opportunity to continue his rebellion. When the plague ended, Pharaoh hardened his heart and clung to his slaves. Exodus 9, 31-35 The flax and barley were destroyed, since the barley had headed and the flax was in bloom. The wheat and spelt, however, were not destroyed, because they ripen later. Then Moses left Pharaoh and went out of the city. He spread out his hands toward the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped, and the rain no longer poured down on the land. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. God told Moses that he had hardened Pharaoh's heart even more in order for him to perform his miraculous signs. But the Lord wanted Israel to understand that the miracles were not just for the Egyptians, but also for them. Future generations of Israelites were to tell their children and grandchildren about how the Lord had powerfully judged their enemies, so that they would know and revere the Lord. The same idea applies today. Christian parents are to pass on their faith to their children in order for them to know, trust in, and live in the light of God's grace and power. Ephesians 6, 4 Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Exodus 10, 1 through 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart in the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. God, through Moses, asked Pharaoh, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? God, of course, knew the answer. Pharaoh would eventually be humbled. There was no doubt about it. But how much destruction and sorrow would he inflict on himself and his people before succumbing? Make no mistake about it, Pharaoh. The true king will prevail. The only question is whether a person will submit to his agenda and enjoy his blessings, or whether he will resist it and suffer the consequences. Exodus 10, 3 So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. The eighth plague was locusts, which would cover the land. The few crops that had survived the hail would be devoured. 
Pharaoh's advisors had had enough of this news. They pleaded with the king to release the Israelites, saying, How long must this man be a snare to us? Don't you see that Egypt is in shambles? Their words serve as a reminder that while Pharaoh continued to puff himself up, his empire crumbled all around him. Sometimes a leader's arrogance prevents him from seeing what everyone else can see. Whether he rules a nation or a family, Egypt was being run into the ground by Pharaoh. Exodus 10, 4-7 If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land until now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go, so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is ruined? Pharaoh attempted another compromise. Despite Moses' insistence that the entire nation go to offer sacrifices to the Lord, the king refused, claiming that only able-bodied men could go. This was a wise move on his part because he knew these husbands and fathers would not abandon their wives and children. If you think I'm going to give you anything more than that, Pharaoh warned Moses, you're in for trouble. But he was oblivious to the fact that he was a participant in a game that he was doomed to lose. Exodus 10, 8-11 Then Moses and Aaron brought back to Pharaoh, Go worship the Lord your God, he said, but tell me who will be going. Moses answered, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, and with our flocks and herds, because we are to celebrate a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh said, The Lord be with you, if I let you go along with your women and children. Clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you have been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of the Pharaoh's presence. So Moses stretched out his staff, and the locusts were blown into town by an east wind. There had never been anything as foreboding in Egypt as that cloud of marching, chewing soldiers. They ate every plant until there was nothing green left. Things became so bad that Pharaoh confessed his sin, begged forgiveness, and begged Moses to pray to God to remove the locusts. In response, Moses prayed, and God blew away the insects. But Pharaoh, predictably, refused to let Israel go. Exodus 10, 12 through 20. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt, so that locusts swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt, and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more, and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. The ninth plague came as a surprise to Pharaoh. For three days, the Lord simply cast darkness over Egypt. It was so bad, so oppressive, and all-encompassing that the Egyptians did not move during that period. However, the Israelites had light where they lived, which was a miracle. Exodus 10, 21-23 Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, so that darkness spreads over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, in total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days, yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they had lived. 
Pharaoh made another half-hearted submission attempt, allowing the Israelite families to leave, but insisting that the flocks and herds stay behind. Moses, on the other hand, would not budge. He understood that partial obedience to God is disobedience. Moses insisted on taking all the livestock with them, because the people would not know what they needed until they arrived in the wilderness. Pharaoh was so engaged by this that he warned Moses not to appear before him again. You will die the day you see my face, Moses concurred. Exodus 10, 24-29 Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go worship the Lord, even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, You must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us, not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them to worship the Lord our God, and until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, Get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. God said to Moses, I will bring another plague on Pharaoh. He will then let you go from here. Interestingly, God could have delivered the Israelites with just one plague or none at all, but he had intended to use ten from the start to demonstrate conclusively his sovereign authority and power over the entire earth. Exodus 11.1 1. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Beforehand, when God called Moses to be the deliverer of his people in the wilderness, he promised that Israel would plunder the Egyptians when they left. That promise was about to come true. Moses was to tell the Israelites to go to their neighbors and ask for silver and gold items, because the Lord had granted them favor. After years of slavery, Israel was finally receiving its just compensation. Exodus 11, 2, and 3 Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. The final curse on Pharaoh in Egypt would be a plague on firstborn children. The Lord would go throughout Egypt and every firstborn male, whether human or livestock, would perish. The distress in Egypt would be severe, but God would once again make a clear distinction so that no harm would come to his people Israel. As a result, the Egyptians would plead with the Israelites to leave. When Moses informed Pharaoh of this information, he stormed out of his presence furious. An unarmed Hebrew issued an ultimatum to the land's most powerful ruler before storming out of his palace. Exodus 11, 4-10 So Moses said, This is what the Lord says, about midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or will ever be again. But among the Israelites not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. After that I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. The Lord had said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He would not let the Israelites go out of his country. Exodus 12 describes the most important annual festival in Israel, Passover. God would protect the Israelites from the plague on the firstborn and deliver them from Egyptian slavery if they perform this ritual faithfully. They were to celebrate the Passover every year after that to remember how God had saved them. The first month of the Jewish calendar year would be chosen as the month for Passover. It covers parts of our months of March and April. The month was known as Abib in Canaan and Nisan in Babylonia. Exodus 12, 1-2 
The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Each family was supposed to choose an animal. The sheep or goat had to be a year old male with no flaws. It was to be chosen on the 10th of the month and slaughtered at dusk on the 14th. At that point, the Israelites were to take its blood and apply it to their doorposts and lintels. They were also to be dressed for travel and quickly eat the meat, roasted, along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This was the Passover of the Lord. The festival gets its name from the fact that the Lord would pass through the land and strike every firstborn male, but he would pass over homes with a distinctive mark of blood. Exodus 12, 3-13 Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses, where they are to eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire, with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Passover foreshadowed the Lord Jesus Christ's coming and atoning death on the cross. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, Paul told the church in Corinth, to make sure his followers didn't miss the connection. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 Israel was set free from slavery as a result of the events of the first Passover. We are also set free from the bonds of sin by placing our faith in Christ's substitutionary death. Romans 6, 17 and 18 But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and you have become slaves to righteousness. And as people who have been covered by the blood of the Lamb will defeat Satan. Through his blood we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7 Don't overlook the fact that we are redeemed from sin by the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 19 On that fateful night in Egypt, God had our salvation in mind as well. This day was supposed to be a permanent memorial for Israel to commemorate. They were to observe the seven days of unleavened bread and remove yeast from their homes for seven days. In the Bible, yeast also known as leaven is frequently used to represent sin. Luke 12, 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Furthermore, eating unleavened bread would remind the Israelites of their hasty exodus from Egypt, as there was no time to use yeast to allow the bread to rise before they hit the road. Exodus 12, 14 through 20. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly, and another one on the seventh day. Do not work at all on these days, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, 
because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast, from the evening of the fourteenth day until the evening of the twenty-first day. For seven days no yeast is to be found in your houses, and anyone, whether foreigner or native-born, who eats anything with yeast in it, must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. When Moses received the Lord's Passover instructions, he relayed them to all the elders of Israel. The festival would be a time of solemn remembrance and joy. However, it would also serve as a teaching tool for future generations. When Jewish children inquired about the significance of the feast, their parents were to explain how God had judged Egypt and delivered his people. When the Israelites learned what God intended to do on their behalf, they knelt and worshipped, doing exactly what the Lord had commanded. Worship and obedience are always appropriate responses to divine deliverance. Exodus 12, 21-28 Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both of the sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over the doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. The stage had been set and the preparations had begun. The Lord struck every firstborn male in the land at midnight. There was a loud wailing all over Egypt because there wasn't a single family that didn't wake up to at least one corpse in it. Pharaoh had led his people to cruelly enslave Israel and to rebel against Israel's God. As a result, Egypt was drinking the wrath of God's cup. Exodus 12, 29-30 At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was a loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. Pharaoh had finally had enough. He said, Get away from my people right now. He freed all of the Israelites and their animals, just as the Lord had promised. The Egyptians did everything they could to hasten the Israelites' departure, providing them with silver, gold, and clothing. In this manner, the Israelites pillaged the Egyptians. Exodus 12, 31-36 During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up! Leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and go. And also, bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. For otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added, and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs, wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. During the Exodus, 600,000 able-bodied men left Egypt, with women and children. Israel's population would have surpassed 2 million. The original 70 descendants of Jacob who had come to Egypt had undoubtedly been blessed by the Lord. The mixed crowd indicates that they were accompanied by non-Israelis. Marriages to Egyptians, like those of Joseph and Eleazar, would have resulted in offspring like Phineas, as well as blending of Nubian and Semitic bloodlines. Exodus 12, 37-39 The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. There was about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. 
many other people went up with them, and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. The Israelites' 430-year stay in the land had finally come to an end, just as the Lord had promised Abraham. Genesis 15, 13, and 14. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. As a result, the Hebrews were to remember this night in honor of the Lord at all times. Exodus 12, 40 through 51. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt, because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt. On this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for their generations to come. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, These are the regulations for the Passover meal. No foreigner may eat it. Any slave you have brought may eat it after you have circumcised him, but a temporary resident or a hired worker may not eat it. It must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. A foreigner residing among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. Then he may take part like one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat it. The same law applies both to the native born and to the foreigner residing among you. All the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions.